Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And we've got a fantastic part one of a two-parter on the fabulous B-58 Hustler. Now, one of the great mysteries in AV geekdom is whether or not the B-58 could have been a conventional bomber. It never saw that role, and it never saw service in Vietnam. But today and next week, we will be delving into whether or not it could have. But before we get into all the details, we have a new sponsor. A couple of weeks ago, the fantastic team at Exter reached out to me to see if I fancied trying a few of their products. And I have been, including the lovely Parliament wallet here in Juniper Green Leather, which can hold 12 of your cards, cash, all those good things. You can also pair it with their new tracker card, which is available for Android and iOS and can help you find your wallet wherever it may be lost, which is fab for someone like me who loses their wallet all the time. They also sent over their fantastic grid backpack, which is going to be superb for me as I'm heading off to the States in a few weeks. You get your laptops in it, books up to huge size. So if you use the affiliate link in the description below, along with my code, the Damcasters, you can get up to 55% off in the Black Friday sale that is running right now. So you can try all of their products and you can help support the pod as well. So head to the affiliate link in the description below and you too can be having your very own fancy x wallet in your pocket. What more can I say? Except back to the show. Prolific author and researcher Chris Gibson joins us today and we're going to be looking at some of the research he did for the aviation historian in two articles he wrote about combat bullseye. Now, Combat Bullseye was a series of tests by the Tactical Air Command and the Strategic Air Command to see whether the bombing results that were being hampered in 1966 and 1967 up on Thud Ridge in northern Vietnam could be improved by bringing SAC crews into the back seats of F-105Fs, F-4Ds, things like that, and also to see whether or not the B-58 itself could have been used as a conventional bomber. So there is a lot to cover. So we're going to split this episode at the end of Combat Bullseye phases one and two to keep you guessing for when we introduce the interesting competition with the F-111 as well. As always, if you want to see almost all of the aircraft that we mentioned in today's episode, head to the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum, who I'm delighted to say continue to be our headline partner for the show. They have got the most fabulous collection of aircraft, including the new EP3 that's just moved across the road from the Boneyard. Be sure to check them out at www.pimaair.org. But without further ado, we're going to get into part one of Combat Bullseye with Chris Gibson, here on The Damcasters. Welcome to The Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. I loved the two articles you wrote for the Strood boys over at The Aviation Historian. Combat Bullseye is something I'd never heard of, and it's... You've written it up absolutely fascinating. But I suppose before we get into what it was, what was happening in Vietnam that sort of needed the, this look to see if the B-58 could be of use out there? What, what was going on in the ground at the time? Well, the Vietnam War, well, US involvement started early 60s, carried on till 1973 and onward into 75 when it all finished. It's got a fascinating air war because it was basically an, a tactical air force that was equipped for nuclear warfare against the Warsaw Pact, taking on what was effectively a guerrilla force in Vietnam. And in 1967, they were struggling. They were having difficulty hitting their targets, difficulty finding targets, and the uh, Vietnamese were putting up a very, very uh, aggressive fight against the American aircraft. They had copious amounts of anti-aircraft guns. And this was something they'd learned against the French in the 1950s, when the, the French tried to use air power against the Viet Minh. And uh, the Viet Minh just 
blew them out of the sky pretty much. And uh, the Americans didn't appear to have learned that lesson. So they went into North Vietnam with a tactical air force geared up for delivering nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe. And it didn't go well. They were losing aircraft. They couldn't hit targets. And really, until the advent of guided weapons and better uh, bombing systems, they were pretty much missing everything. Uh, so they decided to investigate this, and they came up with a program called Combat Target, which was uh, uh, set up on the orders of General John D. Ryan of the, the CNC of Pacific. And he ordered this to develop an all-weather bombing capability for use in Vietnam. Combat Target was further split into three in an overall program called Combat Bullseye. There was Combat Bullseye 1, Combat Bullseye 2, Combat Bullseye 3. And for this program, the Tactical Air Command, uh, who were doing most of the air operations in North Vietnam for the US Air Force, asked Strategic Air Command for help in uh, attacking targets uh, during the development program called Combat Bullseye. I, I suppose that would have been a difficult thing for the tactical boys to go cap in hand to, to sack, to ask for a little bit of help. Yeah, well, there always was a bit of uh, the, shall we say, difference between the two. It's all this old uh, inter-service rivalry. In fact, this was intra-service rivalry, if nothing else. Uh, the other aspect of this was that Strategic Air Command, their aircraft were designed to operate in a high-threat environment, with the threat being heavy anti-aircraft guns and then latterly surface-to-air missiles, such as the SA-2 Guideline. They had experience of operating against using simulations of these systems. And so they had developed their defensive countermeasures to counter these air defences. And that's what Tactical Air Force, Tactical Air Command wanted from SAC. So would they have been training against things like the, the night missile sites through the States to try to get them some sort of variable thing? Because uh, I think that's what um, Sonny Holt told us when he, he was on. It was they'd be flying missions against the US air defences to try to get used to what a contested environment would be? Well, you could fly against your own air defences. That give you experience of flying against air defences. But the specific air defences being used by the Vietnamese were the same systems being used by the Soviets to counter strategic air command. So they were the people to go to. So we've got three phases here because... In the air war, you've got lots of fighter bombers, which makes me happy because I, I I do like do like a fighter by, fighter bomber. That's on brand for me. <laughs> but the, so you've got the, F, the F-100 Super Sabre, you've got the F-105 Thunder Chief and the F-4, which is coming on strong in a variety of roles. We're going to be talking about two of those in the F-104 and the F-105. But when we start looking at combat bullseye as well, we're going to get to the, the B-58 as well. The what was the intention of it? You, you've sort of talked about with combat target, but when we narrow into bullseye, the initial phases of it are quite interesting, aren't they? Because they're, they're starting to mess around with crew assignments to see whether or not experience and different tactics can work, isn't it? Well, phase one of combat bullseye, they, they, they basically wanted to see what different crews would do. Generally, Tactical Air Command flew with two pilots in a two-seat aircraft, like an F-105F or an F-4D. So you would have a pilot in the front, a pilot in the back. 
What Combat Bullseye 1 wanted to examine was whether this was a better way of doing things or if you could put a Strategic Air Command navigator from a B-58, who was effectively a bombardier, in the backseat of a F-4D or an F-104, F-105F, what the difference would be. And it actually sounded like a, a very good way of going about things. And uh, what happened was four navigators were seconded to the, the Combat Bullseye 1 programme. Two came from the 43rd Bomb Wing at Little Rock, and another two came from the 305th Bomb Wing at Bunker Hill. Uh, they used a mix of F4Ds and F105Fs, both two-seaters. There was a catch to this, though. Tactical Air Command put their best men in the trial. So they were completely familiar with all the systems in the back seats of these aircraft. They knew them inside out, and they were up against navigators who'd been in a B-58, dropped into a F-4D or an F-105F, and they had to learn fast. And as you can imagine, the results didn't go well for SAC. <laughs> they... <laughs> <laughs> They were basically stitched up, so it was kind of back to the drawing board for this. Uh, it was inconclusive, really, because uh, they'd loaded the dice against SAC. Which is strange. You think they've asked for this, and then they're stacking the deck <laughs> against it. What, I guess at the higher up level, there's there's this need. This they've identified this need, but I guess lower down, it's we don't need these guys. Our guys. Our guys are good enough. We don't we don't need these strategic boys coming in and playing with our toys. Yeah, but you, you get that in any any business, any uh, yeah. armed forces. They're all the same. So, uh, yeah, that's good. yeah, fair yeah. Point. you're always going to go for your own guys and, and help them. Mm. You don't want outsiders coming and telling you what to do. That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> as, as someone who's worked for a number of consultancies, I feel slightly... Um, seen by the way. Ah, well, <laughs> in my business, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we need to give a, an in, in episode shout out to, um, making Nick Strude at the aviation historian. Cause I'm totally stealing Chris from them for this episode because, you know, it's out of the pages of the aviation historian is that that is where this episode has come from. And dear listener, we know you've only really tuned in because you want to hear about the magnificent, wonderful, misunderstood B-58 Hustler. And, you know, I think we, we, as much as I want to keep talking about, you know, circular air deviation and things like that from, from bomb, from bombing runs and things. We we're not going to do the numbers. Subscribe to the Aviation Historian and, and buy the back issues before they go annually and confuse us all with what's going to be coming in the post and when. But Combat Bullseye Two introduces the hustler. So they're, they're doing this phased approach. First one is to see if mixed crews can improve things. Phase two then is to add a different aircraft type to the mix and. What I was finding really interesting reading your article was it wasn't just a case of, right, well, we'll just go in with with a big bomber and and, and see, sorry, a big-ish bomber. It's technically a medium bomber, isn't it, the Hustler? But they try lots of phases through Combat Bullseye 2, don't they? Because if putting two crew types that hadn't flown together before was tricky, you're now putting crews in very big, very fast bombers with fighters that are not used to operating together so it's they've got a lot to do haven't they so what what what's what's combat bullseye 2 and i'm spoiling it going on to it just because i'm excited well Bull, bullseye 2 was to attempt to integrate the b-58 hustler with the tactical air command aircraft f4d f105f and uh, they were hoping that the the hustler would provide some kind of a protection using its ECM systems that were originally developed to use against Soviet 
missiles, etc., as used by the Viet North Vietnamese. And also, it had a, a navigation and bombing system, basically bombing computers that would allow accurate delivery of ordnance. In the case of the B-58, that was a nuclear weapon, so accuracy is debatable. So they would, the idea was that we'd lead a formation of tactical air command fighter bombers onto a target and allow them to drop their weapons on that target. So the idea was that the, the hustler was to aid penetration using its ECM and defeat the defences in all weathers and at night and uh, successfully attack any target any time of day. That's that's a lot, really, isn't it? To to to, to figure out. Grant, considering the aircraft is designed to try to do that on its own, but then to have to have well, all these little fighters around it as well. That's going to not only do it on, on its own. It was designed to do it at high altitude, <laughs> not at low level over uh, mm. the the rainforests of North Vietnam with a formation of fighters along with it. So uh, Bullseye 2 actually came in a couple of phases. Phase 1, they, they, they tried various different formation makeups to uh, make the attacks more efficient. They tried uh, finger, finger 4 fighter, standard fighter formations behind the uh, Hustler. They had uh, four aircraft in trail behind the hustler. They had a wider spread, a wider spread finger four, either with two either side of the hustler. And uh, they had a V formation. So it was like, I mean, if you can imagine the red arrows attack the target, that's kind of what you're looking at. That's a, that's a difficulty you have with this. And at, at a thousand feet in bad weather, it's, it's going to be really difficult to uh, to to maintain these formations. And it soon transpired that keeping an eye on your formation mates and the the B-58 was really difficult because it was, it was, it was formation flying is difficult at the best of times, but at low level, bad weather, and at a, like five, 600 miles per hour, it's uh, quite hard. And it's a, it's a big delta as well, isn't it? So it's going to be causing quite a bit of, of wake around it, and that's going to be bouncing the, the little ones around. As yeah. as you pointed out in your article, which was one of the problems that they had famously with the, the Valkyrie when they tried flying many things around it, and it ended terribly. Yeah, during this phase of Bullseye 2, they, they actually briefed the pilots of the fighter bombers on the accident that happened to the Valkyrie, and warned them to be aware of this vortex that uh, was created by the big delta wing of the, the B-58 and had to make sure they stayed out of that uh, danger area because they could be flipped over and, uh, well, crash. Oh, we, we skipped a bit. Why did they call it an RB-58 in these tests? Were, were ah. SAC a little bit jumpy about another nuclear bomber heading out to Southeast Asia? Because they, they redesignate it and they don't really do a lot to it other than, you know, change well, the paint. Uh, there had been an RB-58, which was a proposed uh, prototype reconnaissance version of the B-58. But they adopted the designation RB-58. It's basically to avoid anybody thinking that a nuclear bomber was about to be used in Vietnam. They just did not want that to uh, get out. So uh, they called it RB-58. So so this is 1967, so the yeah. 52s haven't gone in yet, is that right? They haven't gone north. I don't think they went into yeah. Hanoi area, Haiphong, until Linebacker 2, which is 1972, mm. I think. Um, I'll, I'll digress from... I'm putting you on the spot. We haven't prepped that one. No, no, we haven't. <laughs> but, uh, but to digress <laughs> of that, um, what prompted me to do this bit of research 
was uh, my wife had been in, uh, had to go to Vietnam on business. So I, I volunteered to carry the bags. And while she was uh, doing, I'm, I'm I'm sure you did. That was that was that was tough. Yes. Oh, yeah, you know. Yes. Yeah. So I twisted my arm because uh, I'd always had a, a, a. I grew up with Vietnam War on telly, so I saw it all the time. Uh, but the chance to get to Vietnam, I couldn't pass that up. And while she was doing her business uh, with the uni, uh, I took a. I hired a guide and we, we did the military museums. And one of the places we visited was the uh, Paul de Mer Bridge over the Red River. Uh, i trying to remember what its proper name is, Long Bien Bridge. And I remember standing there thinking, how could they miss this? Because <laughs> it's, it's massive. <laughs> and uh, I asked the guide and he said, well, basically the couldn't hit anything. I thought, well, that's just that's just the, a Vietnamese political line on this. But uh, they, they really only managed to hit the Paul de Mer Bridge and once the guided weapons came in, like paveways. So hmm. I, I could I can understand why back in 1967 they were having great difficulty hitting targets. I mean, another thing this guy told me was that uh, you're probably familiar with LBJ saying, ah, you can't bomb there and you can't bomb here and that's out of bounds. Of it. Well, mm. this guy basically said that was rubbish and uh, it was because that it was an excuse for the US Air Force to say they couldn't hit anything. So uh, I think that might have been a line <laughs> as well. But you never know. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, it, it that's what um, General Ross Violet was saying as well, which is why he then channeled himself into precision weapons later on. But oh, yeah. Uh, well, they made a huge difference. Anyway. But uh, interesting thing. Yeah. Go, go go watch that episode after this because we've got, we've got fun stuff still to talk about. Hmm. Just on formation, one of the things that you pointed out in there as well was the low visibility issues with um, with the aircraft. Was that a direct link to why... Uh, we've got slime lights, so the sort of green glow in the darky things on aircraft these days. Is that sort of the start of the progression of, of trying to get um, identifiers to be able to formate on aircraft? Uh, it certainly was. And, and this, this is another example of these little things that have massive repercussions. One of the problems we found while we're trying to fly formations at night or in low visibility was the... Um, the lights on the Hustler were too bright. They, they, they basically wiped out their night vision. So, they, so they, they could see the lights, but they were too bright. And uh, they said, oh, no, we don't like this. We can't, we can't handle this. Now, another aspect of the Hustler that caused problems was the, the reheat on the J79 engines had a constant lit flame in it and this could be seen by the pilots but it could also be seen from the ground so even if you had no lights on the the, the air defences could see these uh, well, pilot lights for want of a better word uh, from the engines and they could aim for them so they experimented with low intensity lights fitted on the Hustler, that worked and as a result we ended up with uh, what they now call slime lights. I can't remember their official name, low intensity formation lights or something. Those are the little... We don't need the official name. Sli slime, right. slime lights. Slime lights sounds fun. better, actually. Because that's the colour they are. Yeah. They're, they're the same colour as uh, a toy, apparently. And uh, mm. they've got variable like those, intensity. Um, glow sticky things from back in oh, the day yeah, that you sort of crack. And, yeah. Yes. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> We actually used them for a proper purpose where I used to work. So, <laughs> near raves. Well, my misspent youth coming back. Yes, obviously. Uh, so, uh, that's, that, that's where the slime lights come from. Uh, Combat Bullseye, to thank for that. That's, that. That was really, really cool to see that. 
did this is this is another I'm gonna have to go rummaging because the F four had the same engines and I guess they didn't have the constant pilot pilot light in the back of the F four. Well I've I've been pondering that for a while and uh, the only thing I could think of was that uh, they've got a longer jet pipe, whereas the 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 mm. engines on the B fifty eight are pylon mounted and like fairly compact nacelle mm. on the Phantom. Mm. There's quite a long fuselage, and uh, they're buried deep within the fuselage, so perhaps they just mm. can't be seen. They're there, but can't be seen. I'm, I'm going to go for a rummage when I let Pima, because I know yeah. the one they've got inside still has its engines in it. But that, that's, that's by the by. So stage one, can we fly together? And they identify some formations for which that's going to be workable. Phase two is where they start looking at whether or not they can counter the air defenses. And this is where things start getting a little bit interesting, isn't it? Because again, this is where you have the interoperability and compatibility issues between fighter bombers and, and big strategic bombers yeah. as well, isn't well, it? The, the ECM systems in the B-58 are obviously going to be bigger because they're in a, a bigger airframe. They're designed to counter uh, Soviet missiles like the SA-2 Guideline, the SA-3 Goa, and the SA-5 Gammon, the long-range job. Whereas in, in Vietnam 1967, it was the SA-2 mainly that they were up against, plus a lot of radar-guided anti-aircraft uh, guns. So you get got AAA and SAMs, all working at the same time, so it's the sky over a target is going to be full of flak and missiles because uh, the Soviet doctrine at the time was to launch three guidelines at a time against a target. So triple your chances of hitting it. So the B-58 used a system called the ANALQ-16, which could counter the SAMs, or it could counter the anti-aircraft guns, but not both at the same time. So you're in a bit of a bind over a target in North Vietnam when they're throwing everything at you. The other system was a, a warning system called ANALR-12. And this was found to be inadequate, as it could warn, but could not give you a direction or distinguish between radars. So you'd know, you you couldn't tell what radar was tracking you and you couldn't tell where it was. So really over high over the Soviet Union, you would never need that because you knew there was a missile coming, so you had to get rid of it. Low level, high speed in an area like North Vietnam, you needed to know where the threat was and what it was to take the, the necessary uh, countermeasures against it. In January 1967, there was a, a mission, Operation Bolo, which is famous, and I'm sure you've covered it already. I haven't. Oh, no. that's terrible, it's isn't it? Very interesting. I, I don't even think we've talked about Robin Olds on the show, oh. yet, which is even even more terrible. I'm, I apologize, dear listener, but go... Um, uh, the, Ward, uh, oh, his name just does it. Um, the the Navy guy, he he's got a whole thing on Robin Olds. Go, he he does it better. But I'm sorry if you've been waiting the, for the it. finest okay. pilot's moustache of the modern era. Mm. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Robin, that, that's why I've got a beard. I, <laughs> if I ever try to do a moustache, I just look. Um, Robin pops into my head, and you're just like, sorry, General, I'm I'm I bow to that magnificence and leave it. <laughs> yes. Well, Hoshkett's got a very good uh, famous aircraft pilot's moustaches. So you might have a look at that. Anyway, I yeah. digress. We, we, Joe, Joe, Joe keeps saying he wants to come on and then never does. So I try not to plug him too much just, in, just right. until I can, I can drag him onto the show. Uh, well, he spoke to me a while ago, but never did anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> But then he keeps uh, he keeps messing with my writing. Whenever I write for him, he keeps messing with. Me and I said, "No, no, no, that's 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 wrong. No, don't do that." Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. He, he, he just wants to make it all Ach, I know. controversial. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he loves. Yeah. If you're listening, Joe, big fan, love you. Get in touch. <laughs> you owe me an episode. Uh, <laughs> about moustaches. Anyway, <laughs> Robin Olds. <laughs> the, uh, not only was the tactical air for uh, tactical air command having trouble hitting targets. It was also suffering great attrition, not only at the hands of SAMs and AAA, but the North Vietnamese Air Force fighters. So the MiGs were uh, taking their toll. And uh, if, if you go to a, a Vietnamese aviation museum, you'll see these MiGs parked up with like numerous kill markings on the side. And it's, uh, it's quite entertaining. Interesting entertaining. Surely there couldn't be that many. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yes, anyway. Operation Bolo, January 2nd, 1967. Robin Oves came up with this plan that uh, they would clear the airspace above an area of North Vietnam. They would fit the F-4 air air defence fighters, for want of a better word, uh, configure them with an QRC 160-1 electronic countermeasures jamming pod. And they were configured so that they would, on radars and uh, electronic systems, they would look like F-105, F-105s, strike aircraft. And they would fly slow enough like a heavily laden F-105, and this would act as bait to bring the uh, the North Vietnamese fighters up. Work to treat basically wiped out the North Vietnamese Air Force for months. Cleared the airspace, gone. They fitted these same jammers to the B-58, but they found that when combined with the existing B-58 ECM suite, it just did not work. It interfered with other systems. The B-58 systems interfered with it. Uh, It gave false warnings on all sorts of systems on the the fighter bombers and on the B-58. So it's basically a waste of time. That had to go back to the drawing board. Ultimately, it became a really good uh, jamming system. The I think it's AL ANALQ seventy one, which was very successful. But initially, it was not up to the job when the B fifty eight was involved. And 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 again, that's strapping things on and hoping for the best you know in, in in the great in the great tradition of well we've got all these toys let's see if we can make them all work together yeah try anything it's, uh, something's gonna mm. work and robin also proved that it did work it just didn't work yeah. with the b58 great on a phantom not so much on a on the hustler so. yeah yeah right so yeah <laughs> we, yeah the, the whole whole all of the story about that. Well, actually, I think we can get to what they wanted to do later. So I know that's a cheeky point to leave it at, but repeat views are what we're all about here. So next week, we are going to be delving into what happened when conventional weapons were put onto the Hustler. And it's very interesting because we're going to be talking about circular air probability for how far away bombs drop and things like that. We're going to be looking at what happens when the F-111 enters the mix and what happens even after that with things like the B-1 and tactical air with strategic assets in future. Chris's new book, which is called They Also Served, which is all about RAF reconnaissance and support projects in the Cold War, is fantastic. It's out now. Check out the link in the description below. And if you want to see next week's episode as one big one with today's, become a damn Kastir over on Patreon from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. You get a welcome pack with magnets and stickers and all that good stuff. You get these episodes early and ad free. So if you can't wait to see what happens, happens in Combat Bullseye, check out the link in the description below to our Patreon page and find out. And of course, many thanks to Nick and Mick Strood over at the Aviation Historian. 
for getting Chris to do this in the first place. Links to them are in the description below. Like I said, next week we finish up the combat bullseye story and find out what the results of the conventional B-58 tests were. Until then, thanks for your support. Please like and subscribe, do all that great stuff. Leave some stars in the podcast app of choice and be sure to take care of yourselves. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Dam Casters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.